in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Excuse me, I get distracted. Uh, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment at the beginning of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening via Zoom as posted in the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that, and that take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard or the town's website. And we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless the chair notes otherwise. I will in introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each, of the na each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in the way that helps generate accurate minutes. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Here. Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Thielman. Here. Dr. Rampey. Present. Mr. Cardin. Here. Ms. Morgan. Here. Dr. Bodie. Here. Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Mr. Mason. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Ms. Keyes. Not at the moment. And I'm sorry, I didn't get the student rep's name. Is there a student representative present? Not at this moment. At this time, uh, I will, uh, for members of the public who wish to address the committee on the Zoom, there will be a 30 minute of public comment. Depending on how many people sign up, time allotments may be reduced, but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds that, a reasonable, uh, reasonable time of 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped. Tonight, we only have, we have uh, three people uh, to speak. Uh, the first person is uh, Mara Vatz. Um... Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Mara Vatz and I'm a Thompson parent of a kindergartner and a third grader. Thank you for giving me time to speak tonight. I would like to urge Arlington Public Schools to adopt the quarantine guidelines recommended by the Massachusetts Department of Health and DESE, which would allow a return to in-person learning on day seven if the student has a negative test result. Right now, Arlington requires a 10-day quarantine with no option to test back in early. On two separate occasions this winter, my kids completed a 10-day quarantine after they were exposed at an after-school program. They were either the only one in their class or one of two students in their class who had to quarantine. Their classroom teacher and classmates had not been exposed. Since this happened in January, my kids missed only two days of in-person instruction because they were able to fully participate with their class on the scheduled remote days. My concern now is that the same exposure would cause students to miss six full days of instruction while the rest of their class continued attending in person. If APS adopted the Department of Health and DESE guidelines, students would miss only three in-person days. For example, if the exposure occurred on Monday and families were notified on Tuesday, the student would then miss Wednesday through Friday of that week. And if they tested negative, they could return to school on the following Monday. 
With the current 10-day quarantine, the student would miss three additional days and return on Thursday. Those three additional days could cause serious instability for families where parents or guardians must attend work in person, and they might not be able to take those days off or work from home or arrange childcare, especially since the quarantined students will not be receiving synchronous or asynchronous instruction on those days as their classroom teacher will be teaching the rest of the class in person. Students who miss six days of instruction will be at a disadvantage when they return as their peers will continue learning new content during that time. I'm so grateful for the thoughtful and expedient communication we've received from the school regarding quarantine protocols when it has happened to us. And we really appreciate all the measures that the district has taken to keep our community safe, especially the pool testing. Now, I hope that APS will rely on the research and studies done by the Department of Health and DESE and follow their guidance by allowing students to return to school on day seven after a negative test. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Alham Sadat and Doris. I'm, I'm going to mispronounce this uh, finger. Oh, super. Thank you. Doris, would you like to go first or second? No, it's all right, Alham. You go first. Hello, my name is Alham Sadat. I'm um, a hardy parent runs from 62 Magnolia Street here in Arlington. Um, I'm uh, kind of uh, following up on some of the comments made by Mara Vats around um, Arlington's um, quarantine policies for close contacts. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you for all your efforts to open our schools safely and thoughtfully during the pandemic. Um, our family who includes um, a second grader at Hardy appreciates how well we've been able to balance um, as a district, the safety of everyone in school buildings with the social, emotional, and educational needs of our children. I am speaking tonight, um, uh, as I mentioned, on uh, APS's policy around close contacts um, and quarantines. And similar to what Mara had previously mentioned, um, I'm advocating that we follow Massachusetts um, uh, Department of Public Health and DC policies around this, um, ar around how we um, uh, uh, follow the either the option of a strict quarantine for seven days with a negative COVID test um, and return to school on day eight um, or without a test uh, after 10 days of full quarantine. Um, we, the, the, this process um, played out for our family um, uh, recently and we were thankful that um, the student who tested positive uh, was able to access um, the proper channels and have contact tracing um, uh, enacted and was identified uh, and our son was identified as a close expo as a close contact exposure. We were also thankful that APS shared guidance around um, MAT, um, DPH and DC policies on how that should work. Uh, unfortunately, after one day after that that um, that information was shared with us, uh, we received a second email stating that APS does not actually follow DC, DPH, and CDC guidance on, uh, and only allows the option for students to return after ten days of strict quarantine. Um, Again, re restating what Mara already did, requiring 10 days of strict quarantine seems unnecessary, unnecessarily restrictive and will inevitably cause additional disruptions to APS learning um, uh, for our students. Um, I, I had emailed with um, our, a few of our school committee members and Dr. Bodhi, and I appreciate everyone's responses. One of the reasons that Dr. Bodhi gave for not following the um, DC policies was that uh, it was not equitable to allow families to use a negative COVID test to reduce the quarantine time, as some families may more easily have access to testing options. Um, while I appreciate our intentions of centering equity in all decisions related to APS, I do not think that this policy does that. One of the things that I thought about during our quarantine experience was that while it was very difficult and disruptive to our family, it must be, have been so much worse for families whose parents do not have flexible work schedules and finances like our household that allowed them to access things such as out school classes um, and for me to for me to be able to take a day off of work to take my son to the aquarium. Alam, I realized immediately how privileged we were to be Alam, able to do this. Yes. Excuse me. You have three minutes and you've reached it. Uh, you need to wrap okay, it up. Okay. Apologies. Just um, 
Uh, the final statement, um, we should be following DC recommendations around close contact definitions and quarantine practices because they center both the educational needs of our students and the safety of our communities. These decisions are made thoughtfully by leaders in education and in, and in partnership with leading public health experts. Please consider aligning APS COVID policies with those recommendations by DC as they will provide safety um, and um, proper learning for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doris. All right, thank you so much. My name is Doris Pfaffinger. I live at 50 Colonial Drive. I have a second and a fourth grader at Hardy. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you everyone on the school committee for your hard and thoughtful work, especially throughout this challenging year. Um, I'm following up on what Mara and Alham already said and um, briefly would like to share our story. So my son was also a close contact at Hardy. And of course, we were grateful that all necessary steps and procedures were followed and that we were notified of our son's contact. But we were surprised to learn that we or our son needed to stay home for 10 days per APS policy, a policy established last summer and is not what DESI currently recommends. And of course, we've heard by now that the reason for um, this um, kind of longer um, quarantine period is equity. Well, my son is on an IEP and some services were offered during the quarantine um, via Zoom and we appreciate that. He most benefits from in-person learning. Most kids do, right? Not receiving his services is detrimental to his educational growth. He also thrives on routine, again, as do many kids, but he especially needs the social component of school as many of his services center around social emotional challenges. As you can imagine, any disruptions longer than necessary have more of a negative impact on him. And secondly, um, our family scrambled tremendously during this week as almost no synchronous learning was offered Yet we were lucky. My husband and I have flexible work schedules. We were able to take time off, hire a nanny, etc. Other families may not have been so lucky. Again, if equity is at the center, then we should be identifying solutions that allow students to attend school and not fall behind and parents to show up for work. Um, my ask is, I'm asking the school committee to please consider aligning our close contact quarantine policy to align with recommendations from DESI for the benefit of students, parents, and teachers. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. That ends our public forum at this moment. At this time, I am going to invite uh, the high school principal and the middle school principals to share an update. At the After each presentation, I'm going to uh, go back to the school committee members and see if they have any comment or uh, questions for uh, any of the people at this time. So at this time, I would invite uh, Dr. Jenga to give us an update. Thank you, I don't usually get to go first, I appreciate it. Um, so we're not as far along in this path, so we are, we are the, the last will be first and who's presenting here. Um, as folks know, the current plan is to return to full in-person instruction beginning on the 6th, and we're doing a three-day phase in. The 6th, we'll have seniors and the students who are currently in person um, and everyone else will be remote. The 7th, um, we'll have the freshmen and everyone else will be remote. So the seniors will return to being remote for that one day. And then on the Monday, the 10th, we're going to be bringing everybody back in person. Um, we've been going on all guns when the whole team is working together remarkably well. We've done room assignments. Given that we have to fit classes by the number of students, the result of that has been that many, almost all teachers have some movement or a necessity of teaching in a couple of classes. Um, we set up, we're working on the tech setup. So in addition to what we sort of talked about initially, which was to have a Chromebook along with the teacher's computer um, in every classroom, actually we're setting this up now so that there are speakers, Chromebooks, microphones where necessary, um, and that whole, and the screen and the protection and the, and the connection. So the teachers are able to do the simulcast model. And as we've talked about, the plan is to have teachers teaching it looks like we'll have about 85% of the students in person um, so that we actually had about 10% of students shift from being in the I don't attend shifts to coming in to full-time in-person instruction. So that was a bigger swing than we expected, but we're excited about it and we're able to make them fit. So we're, you know, we're happy, happy to have that happen. Um, and so about 85% of the students will be in the class with the teachers and then the teachers will be working with the other students at home. We've done a number of trainings. The departments have been working on that. We've been looking at different models about how you do that in the different departments. And the teachers have a lot of good ideas. But I also hope folks will have some patience 
um, as we ease into that. One of the things we're really talking about is a fundamental purpose for this shift is really about building engagement and connection with kids. We've been being pretty successful with our all remote model in delivering instruction. So one of the things we're really gonna be focusing on in that first week or so is getting the kids back, having them understand the routine, having them feel comfortable being in school, figuring out all the processes. We have one-way hallways, we have complicated things around lunch and all of those things. Um, we are planning in terms of communicating about this to release a more, up to, a more detailed memo with things like exactly how lunch is gonna work, how hallways are gonna work on Monday. Um, then I'll be having a community forum again on Monday for parents and students. Um, we'll record that and post that so people can watch both of those, the memo and the supporting conversation. Wednesday, which is the PD day, um, we're going to have three class meetings for students to go over the details again. Before they come in, we thought about doing it on the, when, on the Thursday morning, but we're going to have a bunch of kids coming in. We really wanted to talk through it with each class. Um, and so we'll be doing that on Wednesday while the teachers are doing their professional development. Some important things that are sort of valuable to know in terms of numbers, not only is the 85% coming in, but one particularly exciting detail is that about uh, 65, 65% of the students in the school who are eligible to be vaccinated are vaccinated. The last time we checked, we had about 540 students vaccinated. About two thirds of our students are over 16. Um, currently, the sophomore class has a special clinic organized by our sophomore officers. We couldn't figure out how to do it, but the students did. Um, so the students are, some of the sophomores are being able to get vaccinated that way. And it looks like we're going to also be able to hold a clinic for students. I think I can announce this um, on the 12th in the school. Um, so we'll try to catch up with other folks. Yep. Sarah Lee just said, texted me to say, yes, you can announce it. Um, so we'll be doing that in school from one to three on May 12th. Um, and uh, other sort of important and exciting things going on. We've had a really energetic group of, student, of teachers and students, and then the, uh, what is called the Senior Family Committee, who are working on um, an enormous number of, of activities. Unfortunately, what happens is the, as you guys know, the guidance keeps changing. So we have planned about 50 activities. We'll probably manage to have about 10, um, but the exciting ones right now is um, we will be having an in-person graduation with the new guidance that was just released. Um, we're going to be able to much more easily fit all the students up into the stands and give the families more folks that can be in their pods um, or in their uh, household groups out on the field. And we've switched the way we're going to do that because we need more space to spread out the audience than the students. That's why the parents are in the field now and the students are in the stands. Um, we are planning for a prom on the field, a prom-like event, um, and that has been a moving target. We were at 150 people per prom, which meant two sessions, then it shifted to 50, then went back to 150. And right now, our prom is scheduled for May 28th, May 20th, yes, May 28th, and the state limits go up to 250 on May 29th. So um, we're looking at which way um, we can make the best use of the space, the tents that we have rented um, and the guidelines to have the best activity possible. But there's a lot of other activities. Some of the big ones is there's a graffiti night where the kids are gonna write in chalk and do other things outside the school. Um, that's now scheduled on Monday. It was rained out on Wednesday. Um, there's about six movie nights pl planned, although I think they may compress them now that the numbers are bigger. And then Dr. Bodhi mentioned that there had been some questions about transitions. We are currently planning to do an in-person transition program like we have done in the past on the very last day of school. So the uh, eighth rising ninth graders will come on the 24th to the high school. They'll be broken into small groups. They'll get tours and activities and speeches by teachers and by students. Um, and then we will, uh, there's also other planning going into how the transition will happen then again in the fall. And honestly, one of the transition pieces is the current ninth graders who have never been in the building. Um, or if they have been in the building, they've only been to shift or to one corner. So we're going to be spending a lot of energy going over with each of them, the maps of how you get around. We're going to have tour guides in the school on um, Friday, the 7th, 7th and the 7th when they come in. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Ms. Morgan, do you have any questions or comments? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Mr. Cardin. Uh, sure. Um, so thank you for the update, Dr. Jenger. It's, it's 
I'm glad to hear about all the social activities for the seniors in particular. That's that's great that that's coming together. If there's any assistance that is needed, you know, with the health department or with you know finding tents or whatever, please reach out to us. Um, I mean, I think we're ready, stand ready to, to assist in any way we can, uh, or and also with funding if any uh, you know funding is, is needed as well. Um, and then my question is probably not for you, Dr. Jenger, but for Dr. Bodhi, but it relates to um, you know, how in the high school, we really aren't doing cohorting. So this issue with the new guidelines from DESE about who is a close contact and needs to quarantine is, is uh, very sensitive for the high school coming back and also at the middle school. So I'm wondering, Dr. Bodhi, I know it just came out last week, but have we considered adopting the close contact guidelines from the State Department of Health and the State Department of Education? The answer is yes. I was planning in the superintendent's report to talk more about this and I can launch into it now or we can just wait till then. But the answer is yes. Uh, one, Great, thank you. one comment that was made is that we are evolving this year we, in many, many things. And we have you know evidence that supports the, um, the new guidelines. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later this evening. Great, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Ampey. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Janger. Um, I was wondering, I understand that it's only 15% who will be remote, but um, just thinking about them, how are their needs being addressed in terms of simulcast? Do we have all the equipment we need? Do we, um, is there any additional PD that we need to be doing any, or any other? Uh, stuff. You're on mute. So, you know, as I explained, one of the comments that I've sort of posted and talked about before is realistically, the current model is maximized for the remote experience, right? So there is a trade off in bringing everybody back in person. And so I think we just have to acknowledge that, that when we're going to have some kids in person and some kids um, participating remotely and most of the kids are in person, that's one more thing for the teachers to navigate, right? And so that that is a trade-off. Um, but the teachers are um, set up with pretty good models in terms of the teachers will basically have their own computer, a second camera through the Chromebook. We've got good sound set up so people can speak. And we've had a lot of conversations and done a lot of modeling and looked at a lot of models of ways in which you can do that in different programmatic ways. Um, I, I think the answer to could we do more PD is absolutely, we could use an entire summer to prepare. Um, we have teachers who are good and creative and they have been doing a lot of very thoughtful things. Sometimes in staff meetings, someone says, how would you do that? And I have modeled how I would do that and said, so this is to show you what the lowest common denominator is likely to be because you are smarter and more capable of doing this in your own content area. But people have been working through that in all their groups. Um, it will be an adjustment, you know, and, um, you know, to the extent that some folks, people worked, we saw this as we went into the remote instruction, they worked at getting the beats right. The 80 minute period um, is an advantage actually in this model, because it gives you the opportunity, you know, just, we're going to have to spend five minutes at the beginning of class, distancing, wiping everybody in, that's going to be a screen break for the kids who are remote, and they're going to need it, right, and then they're going to come in and the teacher's then gonna organize what's gonna happen in the class. But the expectation is there'll be some breakout groups, there'll be independent work, there'll be time for teachers to maneuver around with kids because you can do that in an 80 minute period. I think there's a real fear, I've gotten this from students, particularly when they see the five minute passing time, that they're gonna be in 85 minute lecture classes three hour, for five hours straight. Um, that is not what is planned or intended or envisioned. So I think they will find they get a 10 minute break because we're gonna to have to wipe down the spaces, go into the hall and take five minutes at the beginning and the end of class to get everything transitioned. So they will get screen breaks in those times. And then the plan is to break up those 80 minute classes. Um, one of the things that I think parents are gonna also have to be alert to is that independent work during an 80 minute class, it does not mean that the class is not happening. Um, and I know my own kid is that I comes down to the kitchen in the middle of an 80 minute class and says, Oh, class is over. And I'm like, 
So, okay, well, they said we could write a paragraph and I'm getting a drink. And I'm like, okay, so you're doing independent work, <laughs> well, then do the independent work. Um, but I think that the teachers will manage and it's gonna be an adjustment. Okay. And then the other question I had was, I don't remember what exactly it was called, but the kids who were brought back to school in person, the in-person academy for a small number of kids, what's happening to them? So all of the classes that were formerly in the four day a week in-person classes are remaining in action. So those classes are still working because those students were successfully in those classes. It may mean, although we're halfway through that a kid or two um, who's struggling in geometry too in a bigger class decides to get into the smaller section. But for the most part, those classes will remain as they are. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And Mr. Dillman. A class called geometry too. I just want to be clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Jenger, for this uh, presentation. The Mr. Cardin asked the, the questions I wanted to ask, but there is actually one point I want. I want clarity if, if I can get it on making sure on the funding for the senior activities, I've received a number of uh, uh, some correspondence from people <clears throat> who uh, said there was there's there's always a limited budget, but I was I was under the impression that we the school committee voted some funding that could be used for event planning and support. And I just wanted to make sure that um, there was sufficient funding for to support senior activities this year. And I know there's been fundraising in the town and businesses have contributed as well. I just want to make sure we have the yeah, right. So you, uh, there was $25,000 and Mr. Mason could probably speak to where the money came from and how it's been organized, but there was $25,000 specifically set aside for events. Um, a pretty substantial chunk of, chunk of that has gone towards supporting a graduation, which needs about three times more sound and an extra 200 chairs. Um, so that was about seven or $8,000, about $5,000 that has gone towards supporting the teachers where, you know, it used to be that if you were the advisor of the prom of the senior class, it was a lot of work, but the students could run the prom. Now it's a huge amount of work for that teacher. And there's other folks on the other assignments that have been um, paid to liaison with folks um, for the other programs. Um, we are paying for the prom tents um, because the senior class has not been able to do as much fundraising as they would have been able to do. And because it's a new venue requirement, um, and we set aside $5,000 for the senior family uh, committee to spend on programming and other things. Um, you know, we could always use more money, but to be honest, it's also hard to spend the money sometimes um, because one of the biggest challenges right now is, you know, is, is not actually having the money to spend. It's, you know, I got two weeks, right? I, I've got two weeks to make something happen. And I, you know, if I'm ordering blankets or imprinted um, mugs, um, I can't get the turnaround fast enough. I got, got to find the guy who's got the tent, and um, you know, we're, so we're doing it all pretty quickly. So, um, if you guys want us to to, uh, to to assign us more money, um, then Michael, will, Mr. Mason, will probably find it. Um, but like in most of this logistics bureaucracy and 500 different people, in a good way. I don't mean this in a bad way, but there's there's so many moving parts to every one of these events, right? If we wanted, they wanted to do a senior sunrise. I'm not even sure if we're still doing that, um, but you had to get a site and then you had to figure out whether the board of health would give us food. And then you had to order the things you wanted to do and to figure out what the food op, you know, it was just an awful lot. Of, and there's one agency in one place and a different guideline for each of those things. So I, I don't know that we need money, um, but um, if you want to give us more, I will happily take it. Okay, well, I mean, we usually don't do a vote by, a, you know, a, a quick off the cuff thing. I mean, I, I, I would just say that if, if you're, you and your committee and your staff feel that you need more resources, you would go to Mr. Mason and then Mr. Yeah. I go to the budget subcommittee and start a process that could result in more resources. I, 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 just, I just was asking. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I have to speak. I just need to say something, there, especially because I've been hassling him a lot. Um, Mr. Mason has been amazing about magically making resources appear when he can um, and when we need them. Like we have not felt want for being able to do what we need to do for money. Okay, so. that's what I want to clarify. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. I mean, uh, folks have all asked the questions I was leading with and the biggest one I had was vaccination. 
and that went by really fast. Can the can, can Dr. Jenger please repeat the status where we are in terms of vaccination and the numbers? Because so the last help. the last time I looked, or we looked, nine hundred and eighty of our students are over sixteen. We have fourteen hundred students total, and five hundred and forty of them had had at least their first vaccination. There and you've got, yeah, and, and you've got percentage is much. The percentage is higher amongst the seniors. Over sixty percent of our seniors, including those, well, they're all over sixteen. Mm -hmm. Over sixty percent of our seniors are vaccinated. Uh, the fact that a lot of colleges are requiring vaccination is helping us out. And so and I'm really impressed by the students who uh, organized the clinic. Uh, uh, my compliments to them and, and the whole Arlington High team for uh, doing everything you can to make this work. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, I just want, I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Janger and all of the high school um, administration and the teachers. Um, I think that you all have had to change models more than any other um, grade level in the district. And I know it's been really challenging and I appreciate all the work that you've put into all of that. Um, and I'm especially appreciative to the teachers who are going to simulcast for the end of the year. I know that that's especially challenging and for your, them to all take that on at this point um, is really admirable. So I appreciate all of that. And I will just echo Mr. Schlickman's comments about the vaccines. I think that's terrific. And I think the sophomores, um, I'm glad they were able to put that all together. So thank you. Well, and, and so that, and then following them, we have our, our nurses who are gonna organize another clinic for us because they were able to get vaccines too. Kids got there first. Uh, I'd like to thank all the members of the committee. They've asked all my questions. I think it's a conspiracy to limit my talking, which I think is working really well. Uh, Mr. Maringer. Thank you. Uh, good evening. So I think the um, reopening of school has gone fairly well, as well as we could expect it. So today was day three that uh, students were back in person. We had about 40 students join us from the remote academy. So we have 620 students, which is a little over about 70% of the students are now back uh, full time at the Audison. So it's been a great couple of days in terms of seeing a lot more faces in the hall. And I think it's given us a little bit more energy at the school. And I appreciate the students have been great with their masks, getting used to new classroom routines. So I think things have gone really well. I think we benefited greatly from having the Monday off. I think the teachers really appreciated coming back in, being able to set up their classes, transitioning and getting ready. Um, the Go PTO, I know that I was talking to Fabian about this as well, and we appreciated them springing for lunch, which I know was appreciated by the staff as well. So we really appreciated having the Monday to kind of prep for the, um, the upcoming week. We obviously had the COVID pool testing. We have over 450 kids who are partaking. We still need to get our numbers up. It's a little over 75%. We'd obviously like to be in the mid 80s or up to 90%. So we're still pushing that as well. Kind of where we are right now is we think that successfully we've gotten the kids back in, in the building, but we now have to look forward to kind of the next few challenges. So the next thing we have to work on is prepping for MCAS, which will be in a couple of weeks. There was um, today a webinar for how remote kids are gonna take the MCAS that I know uh, Maureen Murphy listened to and Rochelle Rubino listened to so that we can be set there. Uh, we are also looking at how to transition. So I've talked with both uh, Matthew about getting the kids up to the high school, but also um, to Madame Pierre Maxwell about how we're gonna transition some of the sixth graders about videos. We need to send out less we need to send out letters for course requests, and that will be in a couple of weeks that we'll start to look at the transition from buildings. The special ed department has meetings set up right now so that we can get information about the students that we will be receiving soon. So the transition and MCATs are really two of the main things now that we have to have to work on. 
We are a little bit behind this year with scheduling for next year. And we have to start thinking about the schedule for next year and also for hiring. And so that will be probably later in the month. And then kind of from a big picture, what we wanna do is, um, there's really two things that I, I think at the Audison that we're trying to figure out in June and July, which is from this pandemic, what have we learned? What are some teaching practices that we wanna be able to incorporate into teaching next year? What are some things we never ever wanna do again? So we're gonna kind of look at the good and the bad with the teachers and what we should adopt so that it can be successful for kids. Cause I think there's a lot of information, a lot of data that we can look at to become a better school uh, next year. So that's one of the things we're gonna work on. And I also, I think one of the things that we're also keyed in is the social emotional aspect of our kids. We're looking at really making sure we're beefing up some after school activities. So we're having some fun and some kids have a sense of belonging. So we wanna make sure that we're able to provide that to students. So when they're back, um, when everyone's back full time in the fall, kids have things to look forward to not only in the school day, but after school as well. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, Mr. Merringer, can you speak a little bit um, just in preparation for Dr. Bodie's discussion around the close contact policy about how um, the kids have been a little bit deco, like they were very strictly cohorted within learning communities, obviously, up until Tuesday. Can you talk a little bit about the, the places where they're now no longer with their learning community? Sure. So the, the biggest place you have mixes with cohort is in the world languages. So that's Mandarin, Latin, French, and Spanish. Um, there are also some reading groups that we offer and some math support classes, as well as computer science. So those classes, the computer science class, um, excuse me, ACE as well, and uh, reading and math, but they tend to be smaller. The biggest place where you're having a mix of cohort is in the world languages. Great, thank you. And also in orchestra and band, right? Yes, yes, yeah. and, and chorus. So band, orchestra, and chorus. Yes, thank you, you're correct. Thank you, that's it, Mr. Hamer. Uh, Mr. Carden. Uh, nothing, thank you, Mr. Merringer. Dr. Ampey. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Merger. Mr. Thielman. Just a general question. Thank you, Mr. Merger, and, and congrats on, on getting the school off to a good start for good things for many parents. Um, <clears throat> my, um, my question is this. I, a few people have reached out to say that they don't feel their child is ready for the next level of education, seventh, uh, eighth grade or ninth grade. Even. And they want to know if there's going to be any um, summer programming that gets them up. And these are, these are, I, I don't know everything about the families that have reached out, but uh, um, <clears throat> I'm presuming that these are students who don't need credit recovery, but need a feel a need, the parents feel a need um, for additional academic support over the summer or enrichment over the summer to be ready for the next level of education. Um, do you, have you thought about that at all? Have you, is there sort of any kind of thinking about a summer, what a summer program might look like? I realize we're talking about the beginning of the restart of school and if it's out of scope, then the chair can tell. No, I, I think, you know, um, Dr. McNeil and I know some of the curriculum directors are working on what this will look like during and what's, you know, certain offerings will, will be, whether they'll be open to everyone, are we targeting certain groups uh, of people and, and what that looks like. And, you know, I, I, I am mixed in some of my, you know, I definitely want to make sure that we're helping out certain students who need that extra help, especially in math and in English, mm -hmm. um, in reading last year. So we offered reading last year to some of our students, which I think was successful. We had two reading teachers that are at the middle school who were able to work with some of our students. So I think that was good. Um, there's also a part of me that sometimes think that the kids also need to make sure that we're giving them a break. I think a lot of them just need some, some downtime. It's, it's been a, a long year for many of them. And for some of them, I think, you know, they need to be kids. So what's the balance between making sure that their kids are not 
regressing with reading or with math and you know when they can be a 13 year old kid and get a break so that they're rested up for the fall so um i don't know if dr mcneil wants to um weigh in or i know that you know i've talked to deb perry who's the curriculum director for english and matt coleman and they have some ideas and i think that will be forthcoming yes i have a i'm on the agenda for a report yeah. for update so yeah. thank you I saw, yeah, I saw that i don't mean to take it out of scope another question mr Maringer, is i mean do you have a sense of <clears throat> the percentage of the curriculum that's been covered this year or that will be covered this year by the end of uh, the school year yeah, I mean, I think most of it, some some of it has not, I think, gone into some of the depth. But I think the, I think what we've done is we've covered a lot of things that really are important for the kids to move on and transition to the next level. Um, so I feel pretty good with what we've covered curriculum-wise. You know, it it is interesting. I think the remote academy has been very successful at the middle school. I think many people have liked the schedule in many ways. Um, you were, you had contact with teachers and students for five days. It wasn't like the hybrid. Sometimes you were with your class for two days. You had synchronous learning on Wednesday, and then you had some. Um, synchronous classes, but you were kind of out of school. And, you know, we have 30, little under 30% of our kids who are in the remote academy. And from the teachers that I talk to, they feel like they are covering most of the activities. Obviously, this isn't the same as any other year. I mean, if you get kids in school, um, it's going to be better. But I, I, I think it was fairly successful. And I think one of the benefits of having K through 12 curriculum directors is they're going to know what is being taught. So, you know, I talked to Dr. Hoyo, who is the head of the science, um, who's curriculum director for science, and she was making sure both the remote academy and the teachers in the hybrid were at the same places. So if kids switched, they were all set. But she also talked to me about the importance of making sure that the eighth graders were at the same place so as they entered into ninth grade. So I think the curriculum directors have done a great job of making sure they're at lockstep. Um, one of the things we are looking forward to and what I'd like to talk to teachers is, you know, what have we learned from this year? What's What do we think is benefited? And what are some of the things that we haven't? You know, in, in many ways, because of the pandemic, kids are all in rows and they're not doing as much kind of group activities. They are doing some on Zoom and they're, you know, it's not all solo work, but it's a different setup. And some of that hands-on learning that I think in project-based learning we haven't been able to do, I think is what we want to transition uh, back to. So um, while it wasn't ideal, I do feel like the kids are in pretty good space for um, next year. And I, I think Dr. McNeil has, has looked at with the curriculum directors of where to start next year and how to help kids during the summer if they need it. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Schlickman. No questions, thank you. Ms. Sexton. I don't have any questions either, but thank you for the update. Thank you, Mr. Marringer. Uh, Madam PM Maxwell, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Mr. Manager shared, we had a really great beginning reopening with both sides of the A and B cohort coming in and a few students who transitioned from the uh, remote academy to in person. So the attendance was excellent uh, on the first day and the last two days of school. Uh, I think the big uh, part all the students and perhaps parents were anticipating us doing was holding lunch outside. And the weather was good enough on the first day for us to be outside, even though we didn't have the 70s sunshine that was promised, but it was still good enough. Most of the students did opt to eat outside and it was nicely done, well organized because they had a chance to practice uh, the weeks prior. Uh, so obviously today we didn't get to go outside because it was raining and next week doesn't look too good. But uh, we had a chance then to do it inside with the three lunch rotation, which was a change from uh, before. So uh, it's all working really well. The kids, um, the uh, advisory committee did a really great job with the teachers. And again, 
we appreciate having that extra day on Monday the 26th for the staff to go over the advisory lessons, to look at the small details on transition outside, inside. So I think it was really well executed. Uh, you know, the last three days going to the classroom, just watching the mood of the kids, their interaction together. So I think it's going well. Um, so the transition, it's on its way and the kids are happy to be back. Um, we in in regard to actual transition of our fifth graders coming into six and six to seven uh, there's been some preliminary conversation with uh, all the seven elementary school just for looking at our children who have individualized plan and what to plan for as they transition i'm hoping to be in conversation with the seven principal next week during their elementary principal meeting so we can have more specific conversation about the actual transition of the uh, all the fifth graders so right now it doesn't look like we may have an actual in-person visit the fifth graders into gifts but hopefully some virtual visit will be possible and some conversation with the fifth graders uh, virtually and with their parents. That's what we're hoping to do. Uh, we have already selected dates for the fall in August for the students to come for their orientation. So we can't promise much in regard to the next two months because there are too many uncertainties, but certainly we'll be prepared to orientate the students in person in the building in the fall. Um, in regard to, um, summer, we are hoping to hold a, a literacy program in combination with some mindfulness and art activity. We really want it to be something that will connect the students more to gives and to some staff member versus really concern about how did they actually do the school year. Uh, the, the whole objective is to give them a chance to come to see the building, to have some connections. So it could cut down from their anxiety to transition because we know some of, of our students who have not been physically in school of the last year and a half are going to have some challenge wanting to transition. So any program that's being facilitated, uh, at least from uh, my reading teachers and our, our collaborating with the art teachers, it's really looking to make a fun experience for those students to come to connect with the school over the summer. Um, of course, uh, starting this week and next week, we're going to delve into prepping for MCAS and uh, doing all the housekeeping step and then communicating with parents and teachers on what this would look like. Uh, we do have official dates, so we're able to start doing the preparations that are required. Uh, I know that um, the last time we present, we talked about our pool testing numbers and they have gotten better. Uh, we have 92% uh, response from our parents of that 92% response, 90% are participating. So far only 2% have opt out of um, taking, having their kids participating. And we still have 8%, we're still working on getting one response one way or another. So that's where we are. Uh, and we have a total of 355 students physically in the building and 126 in the remote program. This is, um, how much I had to share tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, so Madame Pierre Maxwell, I think that your strategy for uh, pushing people to either opt in or opt out is um, really great. I've thought about this a lot about how to increase participation. And I emailed Dr. Bodie at one point and I was like, man, this is genius. I can't believe I didn't even think of this because it's a, it's a good way to, to move the needle on participation without forcing people to do it. So I think that that's great. It's obviously been really effective. So um, lots of appreciation to you and your team for, um, for doing that. And I hope that your strategy can be shared across the district because it certainly is, is effective um, without being uh, overly prescriptive, which is, is uh, really nice. So that's uh, all I had to say. I'm really glad that um, the reopening has gone so well. Um, and I wish you much uh, good fortune over the next six weeks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you. Um, so 
my only question is again about the um, the lunches and the rain today. <laughs> was it was your first experience with that? Uh, I mean, does it seem overcrowded there? I mean, your your building is is much smaller than Audison. How, how, where are you fitting everybody for lunch, basically? It's it's manageable. We uh, we have less desks and chairs in the gymnasium, so we have. Uh, we have our distancing on mark on the floor and we had purchased those little surf desks that the students are using outside. Some of them have opted to use it. It certainly takes less space than a desk and a chair. And some of them had opted to sit on the floor and it was much calmer than I expected. Uh, the students, the numbers in the gymnasium has not changed. It's just that because we add a third lunch. So that has kept it very close to what it looked like before. Uh, we are at capacity, but it's quite manageable. Great, thank you. Congratulations on getting it off the, off, off the ground. Thank you. Dr. Rampey. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to join Ms. Mort about join Ms. Morgan about the um, response for testing, the pool testing, 90 92% is really impressive. And I share her thoughts that this should be shared across the district. Uh, second, when you talked about the literacy program, I was just wondering which students are going to be eligible for this? We're hoping to invite all the fifth graders. Uh, it, we know that the, the children who love to read most likely maybe uh, will not need any convincing to want to participate. But uh, one of the goal of my goal and that of the reading teachers is that we will communicate with the uh, lower grades classroom from the fifth grade to kind of identify which students may had had a tough time with attendance or if they were in the remote program would not turn on their screens. What are some of the kiddos that would benefit from a direct reach out to their parents to invite them and also we want to kind of do a little video showcasing and advertising for the program to show why it's going to be fun and why they should try to join. We're not gonna ask them to do a book report. Uh, that's why we want to uh, involve the art teacher and a visual photography teacher. So they could be creative and think outside the box. You know, They could write a poem, they could do pick a chapter and illustrate something that was fascinating. And we wanna pick books that would allow the children to have conversation reflecting what's going on in our time, especially in regard to inclusion and, you know, just so they come and enjoy the school and we want possibly serve them lunch and uh, have some, you know, ice cream bar and, you know, some fun game for them to do, not just come to do the reading portion, but trying to make it, you know, a, a nice two to three hours activities. So we're going to reach out to everyone. We're not saying no to anyone, but some people we may give them more of a reach out one-to-one -to, -one to encourage them to attend. Awesome, it sounds really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Thielman. Thank you. My colleagues have covered everything. I'm good. Thank you very much. Congratulations on a good start. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. I'm good as well. Thanks for the great opening. Ms. Sexton. I'm all set as well. Thank you very much for the update. I'd like to thank all three principals uh, for coming and sharing with us. And I would ask Dr. Bodhi uh, to make the determination whether they need to stay or not at this time. They do not. So could I, um, could I ask whether I could give um, one report I was going to have from the, super, the superintendents because it'd be nice for them to be here uh, to hear um, the recognition of students in their in their schools for National History Day. Go right ahead. Uh, if I could, thank you. Well, it, as you as you know from past years, we as a district have very strong performances in the National History Day contest, and this year um, that is also true. So this involves a lot of work on students, a lot of independent work. They are um, mentored by teachers in the, in, the, in the schools. 
I think at the high school level, it's, it's a little bit more independent. But certainly at Gibbs uh, and Audison, they have mentoring. This year, um, you'll understand why I'd like them to stay. Gibbs, um, there are two projects at Gibbs that are going on to nationals this year. And uh, I want to recognize these students. We recognize a, a lot of other things, uh, including athletics, but I mean, this is, a, this is really quite a testament to the students as well as to our, our school district. So, um, so first um, is, these are both junior projects. And the uh, one, the first one, um, they're not in any, any specific order. It was about code breakers in World War II. And the two students who worked together on this were Anna Lecoq and Chloe Brentling. And I hope I pronounced those wrestling. I hope I pronounced those correctly. Um, the other, the other um, project that's going to nationals is linking the North Atlantic, how the first intercontinental cable shaped communication. And that was Alexandra Lei and Wan Yi Zhang. So congratulations to those students. But also at, there was a, a project at Austin and a project um, at AHS that um, received special awards at the state level. So at, at Audison, um, the student was Gail Williams uh, Cletus and the project was Code Ciphers and Deceit, America's Revolutionary Spy Ring. Reading a book about that myself right now. So the best use of artwork to understand history, uh, that recognition uh, was for Living a Lie, the Rise of Anti-Semitism in the 1930s. And that is Emily Neo and uh, Clara Schneider. So congratulations to these students. And it gives thank, uh, congratulations to Tom um, Bushell, who is, Bushell, who was the mentor for the students this year. And I think it's a great accomplishment and they should be very proud of themselves. I know that we are proud of them. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you to the, all three principals. Have a good evening. At this time, we're gonna move on to the extended school year summer program update by Dr. McNeil. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. So the last time I gave my report, uh, we had questions. There were questions around staffing and um, students, like how many students, whether or not we had sent out invitations. So I'll just reiterate some of the broad um, points of the program uh, just to refresh everyone's memory. And then I will take it by level. So I'll start with the elementary extended Title I program, and then I'll move to middle school and high school. So um, at the elementary level, we're offering a extended Title I program, which means that traditionally we utilize our Title I funds and we focus on those buildings that are Title I schools, and we provide a targeted assisted learning program for those students throughout the summer that runs five weeks. Uh, but because of the federal funding that we have been able to receive uh, last year, we extended it to the non Title I sc uh, schools. So we were able to broaden the scope and invite more students. And we're planning to do the same thing this summer as well. So for um, we've sent out the invitations and we've received uh, responses back from families. So for the ELA uh, program, we have um, received back uh, 52 students who uh, are going to be enrolled in the reading only program, uh, which will have 27 remote, 25 in person, 31 students enrolled uh, for reading and math, 13 remote, and 18 in person. And then we have, uh, so, and then for that program, we're looking to hire uh, nine teachers. We have three teachers who are, have already committed and we're uh, anticipating to interview six more. Um, some of the other, uh, 
you know, facts about the program is it will run for five weeks for the ELA and math. And the teaching time will be approximately between nine o'clock and one o'clock. We're going to stagger the groups. Uh, so we're looking at having um, small groups of four to five students apiece uh, in each group. And it will be three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. The site will be Thompson or if it's remote. So, um, so looking at the, the invitation that was sent out for ELA, and then now I'll move to, to math. Um, we have 83 or 53 students or 83 students who have respond, families respond to the invitations. We have 53 students that will be in person at Thompson and 31 remote. Um, it, it appears that those students that were remote last year seem to have that preference for this year as well. We will, we will need about eight to 12 teachers for the math program. And currently we have about three committed and we're still trying to uh, identify other teachers and interview those teachers uh, in order to make sure that we are fully staffed. So I'll stop right there to see if the, uh, you want me to go through the, that was the elementary portion, and then I'll move on to the middle school. If, if you want me to stop now for questions about elementary, where I can move on and then take questions at the end. You're muted. Thank you. I knew it would happen eventually. Is there any member that would like to ask a question at this time, or should we let Dr. McNeil continue? Over, Dr. McNeil. Okay, so at the middle school level, we're going to run the uh, reading groups as we did last year. We're going to invite students, so for the ELA portion and for the math portion, and, and basically all of our programming, we're trying to target those students who, who are in most need of support. So which is what we did last year. So um, we're going to identify those students who are currently receiving uh, reading, uh, who are going to a reading specialist for services or math interventionists. Um, this, but it's, it's modeled after the elementary program. Um, it will run for uh, five weeks. Uh, right now we, we have uh, four teachers who have committed uh, to teaching in the ELA program. And we're going to definitely target those rising sixth graders. Um, and then for math, again, five weeks, uh, three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, we're looking at the site, the on-site, the in-person learning will take place at Addison or it will be remote. So again, we're going to have a blended program. Um, and then we're looking at small groups of eight to 12 students. And again, the selection process of those students who are in most need of support who are receiving, current receiving um, uh, math intervention. And we'll need, uh, for the middle school program, we'll need three to six teachers, uh, but we're still, you know, we're struggling to, you know, continue to identify staff uh, for the program. Um, as of yesterday, um, we have two interested teachers for the math program, and uh, we're trying to, um, identify other, other individuals who we can um, uh, uh, interview. And then, so the invitations for the middle school have not been sent out yet, but we plan to send those out next week. And so at the high school, uh, again, we're going to replicate the programming that we had last year. We're gonna have credit recovery. Uh, you know, the high school just, you know, made available their uh, third quarter or their report cards, the most recent port, port cards that we're going to utilize to identify those students. Um, and in typical summer credit recovery courses are, are offered to students who fail a class uh, with a grade uh, higher than a 50%. If a student fails with a grade lower than 50%, they may get permission for a course replacement class that must be approved by a dean. And these would typically be a community college course or a course offered through a private program. Um, and students may access outside credit recovery summary classes that have traditionally been offered at Arlington Catholic or other local high schools. Um, so we're looking to identify those students. Uh, the term three grades were just posted. And so we'll utilize that in order to identify students. We're also, um, offering other programs such as the MOOCs uh, program, which we did last year, and then um, at, the, at the high school level as well. 
And then there was a question around the ELL summer opportunities. So our, you know, based upon the feedback that we got from teachers, and I think that in order for us to get teachers to participate, um, a lot of teachers said they would, they would, not a lot, but the teachers that are participating say they would if it was remote. So it will be remote only. We will not offer an in-person option for this. So there's like two components of the program. One is for an enrichment opportunity for level one students, um, for in which are you know newcomers generally, uh, in order to provide further exposure to English, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Uh, there's an estimated of 15 to 20 students at this time who may be interested in taking the program. And we have two elementary teachers committed to teaching. Um, but we're going to also post internally, externally again, in order to generate more interest amongst teachers and identify. We will also have a K through 12 program that will target students who do need support um, in certain areas for ELL and ELL students that do need support. Again, we're looking at about 10 to 15 for the elementary and 10 to 15 for the secondary. There are currently three ELL teachers interested in providing small group uh, summer support. We can't give an exact number of these students at this time because we're still awaiting the results of the access testing, which we should get back you know, relatively soon, hopefully before June 1st. So that is the update. Um, and this is a fluid situation where, a, a, especially around staffing, where we're continuing to reach out to staffing and try to, you know, think outside the box uh, in order to identify and invite um, teachers to come and participate in the programs. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Ms. Morgan. Dr. McNeil, did you say that the elementary ELL program is not going to be in person at all? Correct. That's pretty disappointing. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that this is challenging and hard to staff, but um, it, it seems like a group that would really benefit for some in-person learning and learning a language on Zoom. I mean, there's just, there's so much nuance around in-person and you just hear, you hear so much more language. Um, so I, you know, I, I appreciate that this is really hard and I don't, I don't know how else to say it, but I'm disappointed that that's where we're at right now. So that's my feedback. Thank you. Mr. Carden. Uh, thanks. Um, so I, I guess we, we get the internal, you know, posting notices that get sent out because we're on the email list. And, and they're, they're really, other than the original official internal posting, I haven't seen much. So maybe there's, um, you know, uh, department heads are talking with teachers or principals are talking with teachers, but um, I mean, maybe $175 a day isn't enough. Um, or maybe uh, we need to do a more hard sell where, you know, we say, look, we know, we know you've had a hard year but we really need to meet the needs of our students. Um, can we get some more people to step up? Uh, and, and Bill can do that as chair of the committee if, if, if you're not comfortable at an administrative team doing that. I think, I don't want to, I don't want to say that volunteer you, Bill, but I, I, I do okay. think- That's fine. Um, yeah, you know, I, I again, I, I just think we, we, we were frustrated last time with, with this being the roadblock, I, I, I you know, we, we can't micromanage it, but we can, can try to suggest some ideas that may um, you know, be, be more fruitful. Thank you. Uh, and, and let me just say that we, we, the, the, you know, the teachers who are teaching in the, who have committed to the ELL program are not our EL, like we have one ELL teacher that may participate at the elementary level. The rest are elementary teachers. They have the SEI endorsement. And I hear what you're saying, but we are, I mean, I, I, I want, I don't want, I wanna let you know that we're doing everything that we can in order to invite teachers to be a part of the program. We understand how important it is, but I can't stress enough to you. And I, and I think that maybe if you did contact some of the teachers and you talked to them, you would understand what they're saying, that I don't think it's a pay issue. It's a, it really is the impact of this year. It has been a very difficult year for a lot of our teachers and they want to take a break. And we, need, and we need them to be, you know, so I, again, like uh, Mr. Maringer's talked about the students, 
I'm on the fence too of putting too much pressure on teachers to participate in something in the summer where they don't feel they have the capacity to be a part of because we want people to be a part of it. We want to be energized for the fall. So are we going, so I think that we have to make a decision and we're going to continue to do this. We're going to continue to reach outside the district to see where we can get ELL teachers uh, to be a part of the program. But I mean, maybe if you did talk to the teachers, you would be able to get the, the, the understanding that we have. And then we have Seif who's here, who can also speak about it from the union perspective about how teachers are feeling right now. And if you look at the panorama survey data, that can also can give you an idea, an insight as to how teachers are feeling. So it's not from lack of effort that we're trying to get teachers to be a part of. And I don't even hold this against teachers. I, I want to be able to be flexible in my thinking and I want to be able to invite them and I want to you know, definitely recruit them the best way we know how, but I don't think it's a pay issue. And if Steve can chime in and correct me if I'm wrong. Oh. Thank you, Rod. I really appreciate um, your words about how difficult it's been for teachers this year. I really don't, I don't know. I know people know that it's been hard, but, it, but boots on the ground in the schools, you know, the preschool has been live since September, five days a week. And I know the preschool doesn't offer some of the programs you're speaking of, but we do have ESY and, you know, kindergarten, a lot of Special ed has been there since September, five days a week, six hours a day. It, it's been tremendously stressful and difficult this year. So I, I know hiring is really important for the summer and getting everybody up to speed, but it's it's been very stressful this year. And I think I, teachers are exhausted. You know, it, it's hard to get through each day with COVID and all the rules and, you know, all the different layers that we have to keep track of and we have to educate everybody. So. So it's just been hard. Thank you, Sid. Uh, I don't want this to become uh, a dialogue right now on uh, teachers' uh, willingness or lack of. I, I want. I think everyone knows how hard it has been for the teachers and the staff and the exemplary job that they've done going forward. I'd like to stick right now with questions uh, directed to what uh, Ms. Dr. McNeil has shared with us on the programs and not the necessarily the deficits. Dr. Ampi, I'm sorry, Mr. Cardin, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you finished? No, no, I mean, my only other comment was that I, I do think, you know, some communication needs to go out, um, you know, soon to parents about what it is we're offering this summer. I mean, we still have, I don't know if there's any space left in summer fun. Um, I don't know if, you know, if parents who were not invited into this program but feel their kids are struggling? Uh, do they have an option to talk to their principal? Uh, either way, if they don't, um, that needs to, that needs to that needs that message needs to go out to parents because we're getting questions about: Are we offering summer school? What are we doing? And we don't have any answers yet. Thank you. Thank you. I will. I, I want to emphasize the fact that the invitations to those students who have been at the elementary level have all been sent out. We sent over like two hundred invitations, so they've been sent out. So those yeah, parents- it's the, it's are, the rest of the parents who are asking. Right, so, I mean, I can answer that question right now. Right now, we, we the, the, the students that we have right now, as you can understand, is that we're trying to staff this program for those students where we've sent out invitations. And again, at the middle school level, we're gonna send the invitations out in the next, within the next week. But as, as if parents are asking, are we gonna have any type of enrichment program I'm, I'm going to have to you know, lean on the side that probably not, but we will have other things that we can offer to them, to students, like we have the online tools. We're going to uh, uh, update our enrichment site. We are going to have like calendar math activities and literacy activities that you know, parents and students can follow along. But as you can see right now, we're trying to struggling to staff our targeted program right now and as summer fun we don't run summer i don't run summer fun so i would have to um you know uh talk to the person who runs summer fun about communicating with that about that program okay thank you yeah my, my request to dr Bodie is that a communication go out about summer programming or lack of thereof um within the next couple of weeks before our next meeting thank you Thank you, Dr. Ampey. Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm stepping over um, Mr. Hainer's line, but I'm gonna ask anyway. 
um, because it seems like staffing is the big problem with these programs. And I'm just asking, have we been asking any can hiring candidates? I mean, any new teachers who are coming in, are we asking them, could you start in the summer and maybe serve in some of these positions? Or do we have any TAs who have credentials enough that they could serve in some of these positions? You know, is there ways of moving that's people? Well, I'm sorry, that's well so, within the scope. Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is talking to the teachers. I mean, I brought this up last time, but talking to the teachers, is there a way that we can create staffing that works better for them like two people doing one role um and just i don't feel we should be forcing anyone into anything i think heavy-handed is not the way we should be doing this but is there any way that we can make it more tolerable and then maybe you know then we can talk about incentives um but those are the questions that I have. Thank you. Uh, to your questions, yes. We, I, I tried to, I mean, of course, we're going to keep in mind like TAs who have certification, but I also want to emphasize that, you know, I have a certain, we have certain standards of who we want to put in front of our most struggling students. And I think that we have to be careful about who are, is going to do that. And, I, and, and so, yes, we are yeah. definitely interviewing people who we feel are qualified. And like I said before, we have a list of six people at the middle school level. I think that, I think for me, the most, the, 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 I think I, I'm very confident we'll be able to staff the programs that I have spoken about at the elementary level, at the middle school level for uh, those students who are struggling. And then we have our credit recovery, which we use Play-Doh. So the one program I think is the most concerned for me right now is the ELL program that we are trying to staff. So I don't want to conflate, you know, what I've said about the ELL program with other programs, because I think that we're in good shape there and we'll be able to staff those programs. I think the concern, the questions that came up starting with uh, Ms. Morgan around the ELL program. And that's the one we're trying to make sure that we have uh, staffing for. So I don't want to, um, confused the, the ELL program with the other programs that I have uh, discussed. Thank okay, you. It's, it's a little unclear from what you're saying. And also, um, I was in no way suggesting that anyone not qualified should be put in front of any of our students. Um, I assume that that's a given. Um, I'm just suggesting have, are we making sure we're looking at every route we have teachers in, and especially teachers who may not have been in a lead teacher position, so maybe they aren't quite as exhausted as everybody else. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. McNeil. Um, how, how many people are we trying to hire for the summer program? So depending on which one. So I went over this information. So, I, so are you talking about the elementary program? Well, I, I was, I, the whole thing, if you could. I mean, I didn't add them all up, but I mean, it's about nine to 12. And at the ELL, at the, at the middle school program, we need about, we, you know, we have about four teachers that, that I, I said that we have committed to the ELA program. And then at the um, middle school level for the math, we're looking, uh, we need a, between three to six teachers. Um, and then at the elementary level for ELA and math, we need approximately eight to 12 for the ELA and math programs. So it's approximately 30 ish, 30 or so FT, uh, positions this summer, something like that? That's yes, but I want to emphasize again that I think we're in good shape in those programs. It's the ELL program that I'm most concerned about. Yeah. Okay, the ELL program is one you're most concerned about. Okay, all right. Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to un understand, <clears throat> and, and in your estimation, uh, even if the school committee or the school department, uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Mason, and uh, Dr. Bodie were to come up with additional funding, that would not um, 
be an incentive, you don't think, for teachers. They wouldn't, that wouldn't be helpful. I'm not saying it wouldn't be helpful. I'm sure like, you know, you know, maybe that would draw some people, but I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that there's two things that I think that we have to think about because there's a salary structure that we adhere to every year. And then we would be setting some precedents as it relates to that. So I think that we need to, you know, talk about that in further detail in order to understand because we have the ESY program and there's a salary structure there. So I also want to make sure that we're equitable and we're not overfunding one or offering, you know, to pay teachers at a higher rate in one program while other teachers are teaching in another program where they've already have a set, set rate. So I think that we have to be very thoughtful about that, but I understand what you're saying. And if I've thought that offering more money would attract teachers, again, I think that we have to thought, think about that and, and think about the implications um, on the different programming that we are offering this summer. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, I, I think sometimes you can, you can increase salaries and you can say it's for this year because of supply and demand and then because of COVID-19. Sure. It's not a precedent. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's yeah. why I would think that we would have to talk about this a little bit more in detail and talk about the implications and what are the parameters. And, you know, so I, I would, I, I think that that would be something that we would have to have further discussion. And I am not saying that it's not a good idea. I think it's it, it, all, all ideas are great. But I don't want to send the message that we have not explored the different things that have been offered today, um, because we are trying very hard to staff these programs, and we are constantly, you know, trying to get teachers to be a part of it. Like I said before, the ELL program is the one that I'm most concerned yep. about. Yep, I, I understand that, and I I, I just want to say I echo uh, Ms. Morgan's comments from earlier, her sentiments earlier, that. Um, if these are kids, if we can get people to teach in person, and I understand the challenges, I, I heard all that already. I would agree with uh, Ms. Morgan that that would, be a, that would be a priority for me, something that I'd like to see. Well, let me just say this too. I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily have a space for the ELL program right now as, as well. So I have not been able to identify a space in person. And with that, along with teachers saying like, yeah, I will teach, but I will teach, it has to be remote. So, you know, instead of going with no program, I'm saying, well, let's go remote because we have these two things that we haven't figured out yet. And, you know, it's getting to the end of the year. So we said, we're gonna go remote. And that's how we got the teachers that have said that they would teach in the program to commit. So, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. And I do believe like we want all kids in person. That's our priority. But I mean, we have to go with what we have. Okay. You all set, Mr. Thielman? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to beat a dead horse, so I'm not going to go extensively. I think my colleagues have expressed it uh, well enough. Uh, the English Learner Program did not happen last year. Uh, because oh, it did. I want to correct that. It did. We did have an English Language Learner Program last year. It was remote. And it was in small groups and they received targeted tutoring. So I want to. Well, I, I that. know that there are English EL parents who were not offered the opportunity to participate. So we, we, we had unmet needs last year because I've been in contact with parents who, were, who, who loved the program in prior years and couldn't get into it last year. Um, th this, this is a huge priority for us uh, and it's an equity issue. It, it's one of our neediest po uh, populations. And, and I really believe this has to be a huge priority because if we're going to move kids through the, uh, through the levels uh, to English proficiency, uh, we need to have more intensive instruction and to be more dedicated to doing summer work to, to build English skills. Um, so I, I just view this as a priority. And if this is a, a, a constant that we're gonna have trouble staffing a program for second language learners, uh, we need to rethink our program. We need to rethink our staffing. We need to look at the staffing for the school year for English language learners. Maybe we're short on L teachers as well. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but this is a priority for, for a population that is not politically uh, 
in, involved in the community. So it's not the squeakiest wheel, but it's one of the neediest wheels. So please, please, please make it a priority to offer the very best program for our English learners as possible, both during the summer and during the school year. And, and, and I'll just leave it at that. It's a, pro it's a priority for me as well. I just want to let, let you know that. Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, I, I share the concerns that my colleagues have um, already expressed about the EL program, particularly the piece about it being remote. I, um, I understand that teachers are tired and I understand they'd rather be remote, but the students really need to be in person. Um, I actually want to follow up on something that Mr. Cardin had asked earlier about families asking what's going to be offered. I'm curious, how many more students have you invited to the um, expanded tier one program this year than you have in years past? I guess I'm trying to get at how many more students are we seeing struggling um, with reading and math than um, in past summers? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't have those numbers readily available. I can get them though uh, for you and I can look at, so I could go to our uh, class list or our caseloads for the reading specialist and the math interventionist because that's the primary list that we utilize in order to compare what we have, those students who are getting that, those services right now and uh, compared to last year. Um, but just to give you an overview, um, we sent out approximately 230 uh, invitations. We are, and I wanna, I wanna say this, is that over last year and this year, and I'm anticipating this year, that we are servicing more students over the summer through the extended Title I program. So I don't wanna gloss over that fact because before, like I said before, I said that twice, I didn't mean to do that. But in the past, we um, had, just a Title I program. So we were only able to focus on Title I schools because of the Title I funding. But because of the additional federal funding we got last year, we expanded it. So I think it was around 120 off the top of my head, students that we were able to invite into the program and provide support over the summer. So we have extended past the Title I schools. So we are servicing more students uh, last year than we have in the past. And then I will check uh, the numbers for your question uh, and get that information to, to you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to, you know, there's, there's parents are absolutely concerned about how their students are doing. I, I'm feeling that way about my own child, but um, just trying to put it in perspective of what is, what is a perceived concern and what is, you know, what, what students are really struggling and are we reaching them? And it sounds like you are reaching out to a larger group of students um, we are. this year to target for support. Great. We Thank are, and, and I also wanna say that I can have more you know, numbers for you as we have our final assessments. So we still gonna have the eye ready and we have our local literacy assessments that we're going to, that we still have to give for the end of the year. And that will also be a, um, a metric we can utilize to understand where we are this year compared to the, to the past years. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. McNeil, for all the work you and your staff have done. I would ask you to, the numbers that you're talking about uh, giving Ms. Exton, would you just send them to Ms. Uh, Fitzgerald and she can send them out to all the members of the committee. Thank you very sure. much for all, for all sure. the work you've done. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Morgan, I would invite you at this time uh, to speak to the committee on the next item. Oh, good. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So um, the next item on the agenda, I don't have it in front of me, but it's um, around a, um, a dedication in the new um, high school building. And so as some sort of background, we have a school committee policy. Um, it's policy FF. I did look it up um, and it, it states that the school committee can choose to recognize outstanding service to the youth of Arlington by dedicating an appropriate area in honor of an exceptional individual who has unselfishly given their time and energy in promoting excellence in education. So I read this 
today in thinking about this evening. And I was so grateful that the policy was so well written that um, it gave me a good jumping off point in thinking about um, the motion that I have um, this evening for all of your consideration. So um, I believe that Dr. Bodhi is an outstanding candidate um, for the first dedication of a space in the new Arlington High School building. Um, I'm proud that the school committee um, is here tonight with the opportunity to vote on a dedication for her um, and to her in the discourse lab space, which is right off of the main entrance to the high school. Um, the discourse lab is an innovative new space that will allow, uh, again, these are Amy Spears words or Dr. Allison Ampey's words from the website. They're very well thought out um, and I was grateful for that too, but it's a, it, it's a, a new space that allows for connection, scholarly discourse, interaction, and collaboration. Um, it's an 120 seat lecture classroom that can be used for shared teaching, um, for staff professional development, as a community resource, for small group programming, and large group debates and um, dialogue. So um, this is a new space uh, in the new building. Um, and I think that it's a really, um, a really great option as a space that we could consider using to honor uh, Dr. Bodie's many, many years of service to uh, the youth in Arlington. Um, there are a lot of spaces in Arlington that are dedicated to, to men appropriately. I'm sure they've done great things, but um, I'm also particularly pleased that the, there's the potential that this first dedication um, would be done on behalf of a woman leader, a longtime superintendent, assistant superintendent, math director, and educator, um, and to do so in honor of her outstanding service to, uh, to students and to the community and uh, to her unselfish gift of time and energy as the policy states. So um, I really look forward to um, an in-person dedication next spring when this space actually exists. Um, so the motion that I have, and then I can speak to the logistics around it um, during, during um, conversation. So in order to follow what's in our policy, the motion would be as follows, that the Arlington School Committee moves to create a dedication plaque to be placed in the Arlington High School Discourse Lab in honor of Dr. Kathleen Bodie. We would direct the chair to submit our proposed dedication to the Public Memorial Committee on the town side and to return uh, to us with comment um, before uh, on our at our June 10th meeting. Is there a second? Mr. Thielman, you got to say it out loud. Second. I know I had a good time. Okay. Yeah, I, sec <laughs> I second the motion. Okay. We get two seconds. If that works, fine. Uh, Ms. Morgan, do you want to? Further. Sure, I can. All I can say is that you know this is something that um, I was able to to work on with uh, Mr. Thielman and Mr. Heim and Dr. Janger and Mr. Chapdelaine, um, and uh, you know they um, were obviously extremely supportive of this um, dedication for obvious reasons, um, and and Mr. Heim, as he does, uh, was very quick to encourage us to follow our policy uh, very, very deliberatively and carefully as is his job. So that's what I'm trying to make sure that we do. And I think that we'll have an opportunity when we come back in 30 days time um, to, you know, to share other thoughts around this as well. So I don't think that all of the, you know, all of the things that we have to say, we don't necessarily have to say today, but we'll have another opportunity to do so because we would vote this motion tonight and then, uh, Mr. Hainer would take it to the Public Memorial Committee. They will choose to weigh in or not. Um, and then we would come back and do another vote um, on the dedication after that happens. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this motion within the parameters that Ms. Morgan has just stated? Mr. Thaleman. I'll do my best. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, so obviously I think this is more than well-deserved. Um, and as, as Ms. Morgan said, and the chair just re-emphasized, we'll talk about all this later, but I do wanna just, I just wanna give a high school building committee um, 
perspective on this. The Arlington High School Committee has a, a building committee has a memorials committee. That committee has recommended that we, uh, at the town, that the school committee <clears throat> not name any portions of the building, but but allow for dedication plaques similar to what we did for uh, Charlie Skidmore in the uh, library when he retired. Um, and, and, and so we had a meeting with Mr. Hyam, the town council, who said that the building committee is welcome to have its um, opinions uh, on the high school, but it is actually legally owned by the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington School Committee has the authority to decide what it wants to do in that building. Um, but I, I, in terms of naming or plaques or anything it wants to do, um, even if it's even before it's finally finished, actually the school committee is the owner of the property um, and has to follow the town rules regarding uh, namings. Uh, <clears throat> however, I will say that the the public memorials committee, uh, the, not the the um, uh, memorials committee of the high school building committee, and the uh, or subcommittee and the um, school and Ms. Morgan are aligned uh, in, uh, in in this approach uh, to this dedication. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the motion? Seeing none or hearing none, I will call for a roll call vote. Ms. Morgan. I think Kathy yeah. wants to talk. I'm sorry, Kathy. I didn't, I apologize. I've got this on speaker view and I, you're not out of the air. I apologize. Go right ahead. Uh, I'll just wait a minute. Thank you. Go ahead. Go right ahead. I just want to say, I mean, you have to vote on this, of course, um, but even the thought of it, I'm, I'm deeply moved and very grateful um, and quite humbled by it, honestly. I was one of the people that had advised not to do any of this until we, we had the whole building up. Um, and I'm particularly humbled because I know what a team effort this has been to be where we are today. And we have a building committee um, led so amazingly by Mr. Thielman. And it's, but it's not just even been the building committee. There's been so many people who've been part of this, not to mention the voters of Arlington. We, we would not be having the school unless everyone really got behind it. And so I appreciate this. Um, I, I, I've never, I never would seek this. And, um, but I would, would want it to be realized that this is really not just for me, but for everybody who's participated in this. And we'll have more time as we go on. I'm, um, as, as, as I'm getting closer to the end of my tenure, I'm particularly, uh, besides all the people I work with and the work itself, I, I'm, going, I'm missing seeing the, the school come to its completion. Uh, but I, I hope to um, be back around a few times as we get to certain milestones. But again, I, I appreciate the thought in this and um, I'm so glad we are where we are with the high school. So thank you. You, you are not gonna have the grand opening unless you come. So that's, <laughs> that's the deal. I will be there. That's the deal. Thank you. We all set uh, on the motion, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. And the chair votes yes as well. Unanimous vote. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I got all nervous and I lost my, uh, let's see. We, uh, we're at the, Monthly financial report, the big money. Mr. Mason. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so uh, included was for your review um, this evening was the monthly reports for the period ending March 31st, um, the ninth period of this fiscal year. And uh, the, the first, re the report includes four reports. And the first report is the report for the general fund um, or the town appropriation. Uh, that report includes a snapshot of the known expenditures and encumbrances as of March 31st um, by expense type or object codes. Um, <clears throat> this report also includes um, 
the projected encumbrances uh, and expenditures um, as well. Um, the projection assumes that uh, schools and department discretionary budget line items will be spent down to zero at that particular time. Um, the remaining balance um, for our for our for the general fund is close to eight hundred thousand dollars, is seven hundred and ninety-seven thousand six hundred thirty-nine dollars. Um, I know that there may there are some questions out there in terms of um, the prepayment of uh, one point three million dollars from the fiscal twenty and, and how that's reflected in this report. Um, and, and and more so, I, I would just state that. Um, that $1.3 million payment, a uh, prepayment um, offset that current balance. So it's built into the, the, the current numbers, meaning if we didn't prepay, we would have actually had about a $500,000 deficit uh, that, uh, instead of talking about a, a projected balance. Um, this, this, this report does not include any unknown expenditures uh, that were uh, that we didn't know after April 27th. Um, so there are some understanding of some expenditures um, after that point, but you'll get a more clearer picture in the next month's report. The other reports are the grant accounts reports. That report does not include any COVID-19 uh, grant funding. That report is at the end of the report. Um, the third report is obviously the special revenue and revolving. And the fourth report is uh, report on COVID-19 expenditures by funding source and object code, uh, reports on all the general funds, uh, expenditures that are COVID related for fiscal 21 only. Um, total uh, amount re uh, reported currently is about $3.7 million worth of COVID related expenditures. Of that $1.2 million is expenses currently sitting on the general fund. M many of those funds are ineligible to be claimed but uh, there are still some that will be claimed and then that those monies will increase the uh, possible back return balance to, to the community or to the, to the town's general fund. I will stop there to see if anybody has some questions and then there's an, another item I will talk about. Are there any members that have a question, please raise your hand. Dr. Ampey. Thank you, um, just a sec. So, uh, Mr. Mason, I have questions about the monthly financial report. First, what is professional technical services? Professional uh, tech services are actually is it any service that we would contract out to a vendor. So um, that could be anything from professional development to uh, a contractor that might work in facilities on the buildings. Um, so it's a very vague object code. Okay, so it could be a bunch of things. Yes. And, and it sounds like many could be COVID related. Correct, work. so one of the biggest expenses is the, um, some of the HVAC costs, there, there's a HVAC line item, but then there's some um, contractor services that are, are tied to that, that are in that account as well. Okay, and then I just wanted to make sure I understand about the uh, prepayment and how it's handled here. So mm -hmm. if I just look, I'm on page four, looking at line 83201, which is tuition to other schools. Mm -hmm. And at um, looking at the available budget at the very end of the line being 830,000. Mm -hmm. If we had not prepaid tuition for this year, we would have been roughly half a million below in this line alone, correct? Or is that what I understand? So if you, if you look at the starting budget that we budgeted on the general fund for tuition, that mm -hmm. would be the very first column, the $5.7 <laughs> million dollar figure. Mm -hmm. That was the original budget. <clears throat> Transfers reflect um, the, the amount that we transferred out of that line item, um, which was based on the prepayments so of about the $1.3 million, which is covering other aspects of the budget um, this year, whether it's additional teaching costs um, and <clears throat> COVID related expenditures, which you'll see in the, 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 the end of the report. Um, so 
like there's about $900,000 that we budgeted in that account initially. Um, so but that was moved from this particular line item. Um, okay. So, <clears throat> so it's uh, not, it's not, I can't read it that so way. Um, the, 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 to, to answer your question though, is um, that $1.3 million, it would have originally remained in that budget line item if there was not no COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, in theory, we would have $1.3 more million dollars more of expenditures. So that, that line item would have probably still been um, had a, a surplus amount, but it would it wasn't substantial. It wasn't to what we've seen last year. Okay. Um, okay, those were my questions. Thank you. No problem. Bill, I believe you're muted. Mr. Hainer, I'm sorry. Thank you. My wife keeps looking for that switch. Uh, Dr. Brody, superintendent's report. Well, well, before you move oh, on, I'm sorry. sorry. I had one more other item. I'm sorry. Go right um, ahead. That item was basically is just the app, the winter sport athletic fee evaluation. Um, it was a, uh, a memo that was shared with the budget subcommittee meeting, the last budget subcommittee meeting, and um, it's here for your review. And basically, we did an analysis as we did in the in the previous season to look at um, opportunities of where we could provide refunds uh, to families uh, due to uh, the changes in the athletic program because of the pandemic. Um, so after doing the evaluation and, and applying a 60% subsidy to you off the general fund of the school committee's budget, um, the, we are proposing the, that the school committee rec, uh, considers the following motion to temporarily change uh, the, the following fees for this year only, uh, boys and girls ice hockey uh, uh, or hockey uh, from $700 to $575 uh, per student. Um, also the, the change gymnastics from 600 to 475 dollars per student and for skiing changing uh, the fees from $600 to $500. And mainly a lot of the changes uh, exist around transportation reductions um, due to not uh, tr uh, transporting students via buses or um, reductions in, in games, um, there's, there's savings. So um, that all that analysis is there for you to review and hopefully you, you guys can, the school committee can approve this this evening. Before we discuss it, I will entertain uh, an addendum to authorize the uh, Mr. Mason to provide refunds to those people that paid the uh, full fee. Somebody so moved. Is there a second to the, thank you. Discussion on, on both pieces, Dr. Ampey. Okay, I wasn't seconding. And what I was asking to speak was that budget subcommittee did pass a motion to recommend the approval of the various motions to the full school committee. However, because this personally affects me, Mr. Cardin led that part of the meeting and I abstained from that and I will also abstain from this vote. And I'm not, I'm not seconding it either. So that's all. Thank you. We, get, we got the second, we're all set. Any further discussion on the motion, the amended motion? Call the vote. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Epstein. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. And I vote yes. So it's six. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, hello. Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Schlickman. Here I thought I had a great meeting and it's now falling apart. There we go. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman, well, how would you like to vote on this motion? I would appreciate the opportunity to vote in the affirmative for this wonderful thing. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. Six in the affirmative and one abstention. The motion is passed. Uh, Mr. Mason, do you need anything further for us with regard to that? Okay. No, I do and, not. Thank you. Is there anything else before I shut that this section down? Nothing else. Thank you. Dr. Bodie, superintendent's report, please. 
I'm happy to give a report tonight. There are three things I'm going to talk about. Um, well, actually, there are four, but we've already gone through the National History Day. Um, I want to talk about quarantine, which was brought up in public, uh, public participation this evening. Um, of course, the high school update and, and also the uh, networking social we had yesterday for candidates of color. So let me begin with uh, quarantine. Uh, there was comments made this evening. I just want to comment on them before actually, because actually they, they, they very much um, relate to what I was going to talk about. The policy that we had all year um, had many reasons for it. And the number one reason was safety. And the second, of course, we, we, there was discussion this evening, or not discussion, but um, uh, uh, bringing to everyone's attention is the issue of equity. And then, of course, there's also the issue, which is now a small issue, of administration. So th the safety one brings us back to last summer. When we were, when we were here almost a year ago, we were in the beginnings of a pandemic. And we talked a lot about six foot distancing. And I think one of the things that we were just, we didn't we really, even as a country, didn't really understand completely is how contagious the virus was going to be, um, whether there would be transmissions in schools. There were a lot of things we did not understand. And even today, they keep talking about, well, there's still things we don't understand. But in the course of the year, there had been a, a lot of things that have evolved. Um, our understanding of the virus, uh, the transmissions in school, and um, what they've been finding in, in that regard. So as everyone knows, um, this spring, actually in March, um, hundreds of physicians, uh, infectious disease specialists, pediatricians, public health experts, um, endorsed the DESI's guideline that, that the distance between desks in a classroom could uh, go down to three feet instead of six feet. And actually that was really one of the, ba the basis for being able to recommend that students return to schools um, full time in person. Because with that guideline, uh, that was, it would be possible that we could reduce the six feet to three in order to have both cohorts and any other students coming back from remote to be in person in the classroom. And there was a, there was a study done, it was a peer reviewed study in March published in the Clinical Infectious Disease that, that demonstrated that districts that had three, uh, three foot distancing, when they compare their infection rate to districts that adhered to the six foot, they, they didn't find any difference. So, you know, our understanding continued to evolve. So, Actually, on March uh, 19th, the CDC uh, recommended three foot as well, also, except in situations where there was um, a high risk of community transmissions, and then they would recommend going back to six. Well, Arlington this week is less than 1% in terms of transmissions. And we've talked about cases per 100,000, but the fact is the number of cases in general, have been coming down in Arlington, and you know we're we still at this point um, have no evidence of transmissions in our schools. In fact, when we've had classes that have been um, quarantined, this a child or this a teacher who was in that class. Um, and may have tested positive or may even become symptomatic and test a positive then. They were in the class prior to actually the quarantine. And we, we know now that they were, in, they were contagious at that time. And what we have found is that the students who were quarantined as part of uh, that identification of the, of the individual we have not seen any cases of transmission. So our own experience along with the, the research that's gone on and our understanding of the virus, 
you know, we're we're at we're co we've come to a point where there was a uh, this week the uh, Jesse recommended that if um, students were less than three feet um, um, with a total of fifteen minutes of contact over a twenty four hour period, and I emphasize the word total because they also came out um, uh, I don't know it was a month ago or sometime around there that the 15 minutes was like, was a cumulative. It wasn't a single 15 minutes. So again, this is evolving. And uh, as we, we evolve as also as a school district with this, and yes, we are prepared at this point to, um, there are two guidelines from the state with regard to quarantine. One is that you don't have a test after, um, after exposure that you that anybody can come back to school um, after 10 day um, 10 days in quarantine return on day 11 and that's what we've been operating with but we all there is a there was an or to that or you could have um, a, a student or a teacher for that matter at, after quarantine uh, test on day five and return on day eight. It's actually at the end of day seven. So effectively it's day eight. And we are prepared to align with that. We've been talking about um, what we would do about equity and we have, not completely, but we have, we have looked at how we can make sure that anyone who does not have access to um, testing to be able to get access and we've also looked at how we're going to do this administratively because it's no small task. If you have a group of students, a whole classroom worth of students, or in the middle school, we've had whole learning communities out. You have to be able to um, actually, it's not just getting the negative test, it's making sure that the test was done on the fifth, at least no earlier than the fifth day from the day of exposure. So we are we are we have a, we have been working on this and we are prepared to move to that um, to align with that more minimal um, uh, mi the minimal number of days that a, a student needs to be quarantined. And I think that you know it, the point that was made by some parents this morning. I, I think that we all realize that when we're now back full time in person that the number of days that a student um, can miss um, actually grows uh, from what it was before. And so that's certainly uh, something that has been pushing us also besides all of the, um, the data we have on our own experience, as well as what's going on in other districts. So we are going to do that. And um, we, we, you know, I think it's going to be, um, we're going to have to sort of work, work with this to see what that is going to look like. And with um, a particular, uh, with a positive case that may come up. And for sure, a positive case will, that's certainly been true all year. But I'm actually very pleased to report tonight that we did pool testing this week. Um, we have a, a rate, we, our average is right around 90% in terms of participation. Um, every classroom was tested this week and we had no positive cases. So that is, that is that, um, um, tremendous. We're very happy about that. And we will continue to do pull testing because I think now it's even more important than it has been even before. Uh, we're, we're increasing the number of students that are going to be in the buildings every day. Um, and the middle school just started this week, as you know, we had those reports this, this evening, the high school in two, in two weeks. So the pool test, pool testing allows the district to have, us, have an individual who tests positive, go into quarantine um, and not necessarily expose a lot of people to the to the virus. What is going? What is happening in the middle school this week is we're going to have more cross teaming, and the potential for um, exposure only 
increases. So the more we can identify a case early, um, the more we can protect both the students and the staff in our buildings. So I did want you to know that. Um, there are some exemptions now to quarantine that did not exist before. Uh, one that had existed before is that if you had um, a, 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 de a definite positive to quarantine the first 90 days after, your, um, after having been tested positive. Um, see, my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay, great. Um, and then now the, the, the second way that you can be exempt from quarantine if you are fully vaccinated. And as we have more, you know, our staff was absolutely amazing. Parents were amazing in helping to get our staff and um, vaccinated. Uh, we also now have a large number of students that are vaccinated. So right now the, the percent on the seniors I just checked yesterday was 67%. So uh, that, that increasingly is making our schools safer and safer. And so I'm hoping that as we go forward this spring, we're gonna see fewer, uh, in, you know, fewer uh, positive cases as a result of pool testing. We probably will still have uh, families report that there's a uh, COVID case in their family and uh, have their, um, their child uh, not attend school. Those are gonna probably continue, but even that, those numbers are going down. And that is the trend that we wanna see. So it's quite, it's quite a year and we're learning and we're growing and one of the things that we need to plan for for next year um, is that while the projection is that students that are age 12 and older will probably have access to vaccines this summer and hope we still have the same um, you know number the same percentages and higher getting vaccinated we will definitely not have vaccines at the elementary level so we we will still have a lot of safety protocols in place um, but I think that as we, we move, we grow and evolve and understand, um, we are going to be able to minimize as much as possible um, students being out of school. And that's what we all want to see. And that's what we're hoping to achieve this spring as well as certainly in the fall. So I don't know actually if there'd be any comments or questions at this point. Let me see if my notes, if there's anything I wanted to mention, uh, you know, that, you know, some, all of what I've said also has um, impacts on buses. And, you know, we will continue to be in contact with, with uh, families to let them know that there, there could have been a, a positive case um, in their LC or their, uh, or their um, classroom, but we will, we will have a different prism to look for toward in terms of the, the amount of exposure um, at, uh, at three foot, at less than three feet. So um, before I go on, does anybody want to ask a question about any of this? I may have missed them. Ms. Morgan. So Dr. Bodie, just so that I understand, and I, I appreciate um, your uh, you and your team's responsiveness and iteration through this because these are, they're challenging and I feel like I keep bringing the documents back up to look at them myself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what you're saying is, is that it, we, we are entering a time where it may be that even though a student is in a classroom with a positive case, that they may not automatically be quarantined. I think, yes, that is an accurate um, statement. And, but I also think it's a little bit more nuanced. We hope that that will be the case, but we want to reserve the judgment given the particular situation. And who will um, be making those decisions? Um, who will be making those? Uh, that will be um, a, actually a combination of people. Uh, it will be a school nurse, be the principal of the building, 
um, our coordinator of uh, our director of nursing, our coordinator for pool testing will look at the situation as well. And I, I will certainly be advised and consulted on, on these decisions. I, I have been all year, so I don't think that will change. So it's not any one person, it's a team of people looking at this very carefully. Okay, I, I, and I'm, I'm glad that there will be a team. I hope that it's, you know, I hope the decisions are made obviously with safety in mind first and foremost, certainly. Um, but then, you know, secondly, with a, a desire to keep healthy students in the building as mm -hmm. much as possible, and also, you know, to avoid um, quarantines, which we've done in our family. And it's it's not just about, you know, the kids not being in school and not learning remotely. If they're quarantined, they're not, you know, they're not playing with their neighbors, they're not in their soccer game, they're not doing their first yeah. communion, they're not, you know, we're certainly entering a time period where um, there are more events and activities that become, you know, very challenging to not participate in. And again, you know, got to be safety is paramount. And, you know, we certainly want to be um, want to be cautious, but I hope that it's done, uh, the decisions around quarantine for students is done really mindfully and with an eye to um, being really consistent across buildings and schools mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we don't start to hear things where we're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. So right. um, I'm glad that, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you'll be on top of this because you have been all year long. Um, and I, you know, I appreciate the parents that came to speak tonight. We've experienced that in our family and the situations where students are separated from their classrooms and their classes. And I've said this to you because it's happened to us. It's, it's devastating. Um, and when they're, where, when their classmates continue on without them in school, um, and, and I'm glad that it's not 11 days, or I'm glad it's not a return on day 11. But um, so anyway, thank you. That's all I have. Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, thank you for all of the thought and, and preparation and updates um, about all of these evolving things. Um, I'm just looking for a little bit of clarity on the return on day eight versus day 11. So I heard you say you're prepared to align and you're gonna work with this and try to figure out how to test students. I understand the administrative complexities um, with the larger learning center cohorts. Is this a change that's happening tomorrow? Is this a protocol that you're still discussing? Like when, no. when are you making this? Okay. No, we're doing it now. We've been, uh, uh, had a lot of discussions about this. Um, I've also talked with members of the health department and um, about about where we are, and they are very supportive. So, you know, we fortunately we did not have any uh, positive cases this week. Amazing, actually, given the fact that we were very worried about this after a publication, um, but we didn't. So, but no, that is in effect now. Um, and I wanted to bring this up this evening so that everybody was aware of that. And at this at this point, um, you know, we're just going to we're going to take each case as it comes along. But I do agree that you know when 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 the positive case comes from outside or family, they they get tested in the family, and the, and the student is out of school, we will work with the family so that they can, you know, minimize that test on day five from day of exposure. That, that's one thing that is part of this whole formula is what is the date of exposure? And that's one of the reasons why we need to work with our nurses and director of nursing on this because, um, you know, that, that is part of the calculus on the decisions as well. Great, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm still a little confused mm -hmm. um, because if a school cohort has an exposure, then it's obviously impacting everybody within that, that pod or cohort. So that if everybody in that cohort is quarantined, that's one thing. But say in the example that we heard tonight of an after-school program that you have 
only one child within a grade level or a class that's impacted and we come back with a, a test five days later that's negative, there shouldn't be a reason why we can't bring that child back into the class because uh, uh, we're satisfied with a, with a high quality negative test. So my question is, in the context of the discussion we had from the parents this evening, that if we detect an exposure, say in an after school program or some other exposure outside of one of our classrooms, what is going to happen to that child in terms of a testing requirement and being able to return to their class? Um, in that particular case, it, 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 it rests on what was the exposure if it's less than three, it has to, you know, if they're less than three feet um, and there's been more than 15 minutes of exposure over the 24 hours, 24 hours is from, you know, for, it's a fair amount of time when you're looking at total amount. This is why- So, it's we're, a, so we're assuming there was an exposure. I'm, uh, th this is yep. what the discussion was. Let's assume there, what we, we documented exposure. Can this parent five days later get a test and not have to be out for 10 days? They're not out there. They, yes, they can get a test on day, no sooner than day five on the day of exposure. The state still is saying that you return at the end of the seventh day, which is essentially One day eight for all practical mm -hmm. purposes. Um, yes, we're going to do that. Uh, and we're, we're finding the, um, the administ we've hired another person that's going to help in this mm -hmm. process when a particular school might get overloaded with this. And because mm -hmm. it's, you, you do have to check those, the date of exposure and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the test. And while it says antigen test, we have been saying by next now, I said that a couple, another meeting ago, or, you know, it's a PCR, you can, or it's an antigen by next now. You can get over the counter by next now. I don't, I know for sure at Walgreens, but I don't know other places. But again, it's the equitable issue is, it's one thing to be able to go get it. It's another thing to afford it. And we know that there are families that do not have exposable $20 or whatever it costs. I don't really know what the cost is right now, but um, it had been that expensive. We are working on a way to make sure that that family has the ability to get tested. That's what we're- Yeah, that, that, that's important because I know that when we have a low income family, we, we don't let a, a user fee get in the way of participation in, right. in, in sports. Right. And rather than adding barriers or not holding the sport, uh, we're finding ways to fund for low-income uh, families. And I would think that some of the federal mon money for uh, COVID-related issues would certainly be able to be used to provide testing for low-income eligible yes. families. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, it can. So I, I just want to say that I, I appreciate the care and concern, but I think that we really need to cut short quarantines when it doesn't make sense medically to do so. And if we can document uh, a, a case, a, a, a negative test, uh, we should bring those kids back and we should find a way to make the testing affordable for uh, low income right. families. Uh, all, all, all of that, we, we agree. We don't want kids out of school mm -hmm. if they don't have to be out of school. As I said, I think that we are all, and I say we as a society, as a state, mm -hmm. DESE, we're all evolving in what, um, what is safe. Um, and we've been cautious and that has been supported uh, that particular our cautiousness, and I think that it has paid off in the safety of our students and staff. But I do agree that one of the 
it's 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 easier when a whole class is out or a whole LC mm -hmm. because then they're mm -hmm. getting remote. What gets yeah. really difficult is the when a particular student may from a sports team be out mm -hmm. or they might have been after school programming out because their class isn't out. So we want to make sure that they continue in education. And you know, uh, I, I give a lot of credit to Principal Parrots, who was mm -hmm. able to rearrange a lot of things on very short notes. That's the other thing. These mm -hmm. things happen. You know, we don't get a lot of notice on this happening. Mm -hmm. And um, was able to get synchronous instruction for the students that were in those second and third mm -hmm. grade classrooms. But, you know, th that's still not the same thing as being in person. And we know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think that I, I welcomed what came out this week from Desi. I think that mm -hmm. it, it makes sense. And um, we certainly want to do everything we can to one, keep the school safe. Mm -hmm. And two, keep kids in school as much as possible. Yeah, I think that uh, oh. my colleagues understand and know that I've been one of the most cautious members of this committee in terms of reopening and bringing kids back. But the uh, on the other side is that given the evidence that, that we've gotten now, given the fact that we've got a, a, a really good pool testing program running, um, when parents come to us with concerns over our policy or our protocols, if they're conflicting with current uh, state or federal uh, practices, uh, you know, we, we, we have to think this out and figure out what, what, what an appropriate response is for the parents. And I was very sympathetic to the parents who were coming before us uh, on this topic tonight, and I'm glad it's gonna be addressed. I, we need to get these kids back in if we know that they are not uh, contagious. Uh, and uh, through through the testing program, we can do that. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. You're going to mention uh, talk about the uh, kindergarten enrollment. Oh yes, that was one of the uh, the the yes. I, you all received the uh, the chart. Um, in Yes, that should be my other one. It is. Uh, it depends on which paper I'm looking at. I do have enrollment here too, and I know that Dr. Allison Ampe um, also would like to have enrollment numbers for the other grades as well. And I will get that to you. Um, I think that the 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 way it looks right now, you and I think what you're asking for. I just going to clarify that are the the students that are in registry now um, that are new, that will be new, new to school next year. I will say though, we also had students that many, but we've had a number of students have um, enrolled even the spring, but of course that's always true. We, enrollment goes on throughout the entire year, um, but it has picked up a little bit more. So yes, but you have the chart. Um, it, there's two categories which are important to understand in the chart. It's the number that are approved, which means that all of the documents are in, and those that are pending, waiting for some other documentation. And right now with the pending, uh, we're about 426, which is about where we would be this time in the spring. I, I, I often expect it to get a little bit more toward the mid four mid 400s when we get closer to um, kindergarten orientation. And this year that will not be similar to last year. It's gonna be much more virtual. We are, are going to do kindergarten screens and all of this information will be, ha will be sent to kindergarten parents. But generally um, when we, there's a certain bump as we get closer to kindergarten orientations, in terms of registrations. So um, we'll keep, you know, monthly we'll get, we get those reports um, weekly. They don't change very much from week to week, but we're happy to share it with you um, as we get them. All right, so anything more on enrollment? Any questions for Dr. Bodie on that? 
Go ahead, Dr. Bodhi. I will say one more thing on enrollment. Uh, we're up to date on buffer zones. And um, we'll con once we got through the, the major group, uh, we're staying up to date pretty much on every couple day basis. So uh, with respect to the high school, um, it's been a busy time for subcommittees of the high school building committee. And the two busiest right at the moment are the interior subcommittee and the exteriors, of both, both of which I chair. Um, the interiors, uh, we, are, we have met already a week ago and we're gonna meet again next week. It, it's, it's about colors in the building and designs and patterning. Um, so that is going on. And I've talked about that the last meeting. The exteriors committee um, is uh, looking at mortar <laughs> for the bricks. And um, th that, that, I mean, th there's a certain time element in getting this decided. I think um, we have a mock-up that's been we that's been put up, so we can also see what it will look like with windows and the different designs. So that even though you have the same color brick, there's different designs of the brick whether it comes out or there's in different patterning. And there is it the at the on the on the part of the building that faces the fields. Uh, the uh, bottom of the building is going to be a CMU, which is very close to the color of the brick, but not quite. And so it's not only just the brick, it's the CMU. The CMUs, um, which is a, it's a form of a brick. It's a natural material. It's a, it's a bigger, um, you, we talked about that when the building was being designed. But I think that if you're interested in seeing the mock-up, um, it's in the, um, the old basketball field. Um, behind the high school. I think it may only be up another day or so, but at any rate, it's very busy. The, the, um, the building committee is meeting next week and people are most welcome to, to link into it. And Mr. Thielman has agreed to give a report to town meeting. I don't think we've figured out what night it's going to be, um, but uh, I, I know that there's a wider audience uh, with town meeting people are listening. So it's a, it's a way to have people understand what's happened since last this time last year to now. And you don't have, you know, you go down Mass Ave, you can see what mainly is, is happened. And it's really every day, it just, it changes. So uh, those are the, 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 the updates right now on the high school. And I will, I want to thank um, Dr. Allison Ampey and Amy Spears, who uh, Amy Spears is the chair of the communications subcommittee. I should say that's been active committee as well uh, because they're helping organize some of the photos that will be shown in the report. And of course, keep the website up to date. And I really encourage people to look at the AHS building website. Um, you can actually sign up to get notices. So it's a great way to stay on top of the building project. And then the last thing, uh, I wanted to mention is that yesterday, you know, for, for maybe about 12 years now, I don't, maybe it's, I think it's been at least 12 years, we've had an annual um, coffee social for um, candidates of color that has been um, partnered to, to, um, to have with the superintendent's diversity committee. And uh, clearly we're not doing that this year. Um, but I have to say the Zoom networking social that we had yesterday was actually very, very successful. And I, I wanna acknowledge Mr. Spiegel for organizing it and thank Mr. Hainer and Ms. Exton for coming because I think it, it is important um, to have a member of the school committee there. It shows that we, we have shared goals about and our seriousness about hiring um, staff of color. We had, um, I think we had, I didn't count, but I went into different breakout rooms. We had a general introduction and then we went into breakout rooms. We've all become very adept over the year and moving in and out of breakout rooms. Uh, but uh, the breakout rooms went by um, ele elementary, middle, high school, and then any district-wide positions. So 
Um, we had what, about 20 or so candidates come total, something like that. Yeah, that's about yeah, right. a couple less than that, but yeah, they, they, they said they were going to come, they registered, but didn't come. But all in all, it was very successful. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to hire um, some people um, that, that came. But the one thing that we do guarantee them for sure is that they will have an interview. Um, sometimes people come that they have a certification that's not relevant to what, what we're hiring at the time, but we, we encourage them. Um, and we'll keep their, we will keep watching if there is a, a position that comes up to make sure that they have an interview, even if it's a position that comes up, uh, you know, later June or during the summer. Um, so that's my report for this evening. Thank you for um, uh, having the opportunity to give all these reports. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Move on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant dated April 13th, 2021, warrant number 21233, total warrant amount $651,758.94. Minutes for approval, school committee regular meeting, April 8th, 2021. Is there a motion to approve? Move. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call vote. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, budget, Dr. Rampey. Can't talk now, sorry. Okay. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Um, thank you. So uh, Mr. Hainer held a chat on April 17th for grades six through 12, and there were 10 participants. Um, and there were some questions that um, Dr. Bodie uh, responded to in her update. And then there were some other questions about um, quarantining protocols, perhaps changing in the fall and questions about locker use next year. And those will be updated uh, in the summer in August. And we will share that out at that time. There is no chat this weekend. The next chat is on Saturday, May 8th for families of children receiving special education services. Um, but all of our meetings are open to anyone in the community to join. Um, and I also want to encourage families with children on 504s um, to feel included in that special education um, group, even though I realize that's not exactly the same. Um, and I think that's everything. Thank you. Thank you. The curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, I have no report. Do you want me to give up the budget report in Kirstie's absence or? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we did we did meet, I don't remember if it was the last week or the week before. Um, it, I think it was last week before the long range planning committee meeting. Um, the uh, long range planning committee meeting, um, uh, the finance committee, as I think you all saw, saw approved our budget, but also approved um, the creation of the recommending, supporting the creation of a study committee basically to study our budget and are the formula that's behind, that's that's in the long range plan for our budget. Um, there was discussion about that at long range plan. Um, it's unclear to me <laughs> how that's moving forward, but the it, there was um, agreement that we should move forward on that. Um, the question is timing. I think Mr. Foskett wants that to happen um, immediately. I think everybody else thinks it can wait till um, we get a better idea of how we can spend our federal aid money and some other things. So um, uh, that will proceed uh, uh, or not proceed over the next few months. Did I get that right, Jane? Yep, that sounds good. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, just to touch back to my friends in the budget subcommittee. 
the statement was made in town meeting the other night that uh, uh, our costs are exceeding the inflation rate. But uh, I, th I think the point needs to be made that schools buy things that are not on a consumer price index, such as uh, uh, medical care and out of district special ed services, uh, which have increased in cost far beyond the uh, consumer price index. So that to compare what we do to a consumer price index really isn't valid. And I think that we really need to be very specific in terms of cost drivers on the school side, uh, even without the enrollment increases we faced. Uh, so I, I just think that's important. On, on the, on the uh, policy side, uh, we talked earlier about uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, and it, it, this was adapted by, uh, by town meeting through Articles 12 and 86 in the consent agenda. So it is now town policy, and I think that we should put on the agenda for next week a motion to uh, change our district calendar to reflect Indigenous Peoples Day consistent with the vote of the town. Article 85 established the land acknowledgement statement, and we can either decide that we want to announce it at all meetings or refer it to either policies or community relations as to how often and where to state it. Um, so that, that certainly is a topic that we need to, uh, to resolve that we talked about earlier. And finally, uh, at the request of the chair, uh, I've talked to Mr. Kucher about doing a retreat in the summer. Uh, I think that all of us agree that doing a retreat and orientation to build our skills at working with a new superintendent is important. And it would probably require for an initial phase to get started of two four hour sessions, be it on a Saturday morning or uh, on an evening. and in the summer, we should be in a position where we'll be able to do it in person together. So uh, if you can communicate to me parameters over the summer of when you can do it, when you can't do it, what days or hours would be wonderful or awful, uh, just as a, as a uh, sketch so I can go and talk to Mr. Kuchar and get some proposed times at work with the rest of the committee. Uh, does that meet with your approval, Mr. Chairman? Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We meet on Tuesday, Dr. Bodie summarized everything that's going on. Uh, we meet on Tuesday, May 4th at 6 p.m. Liaison reports, does anyone? Announcements? The chair has one announcement. Uh, the Rotary Club of Arlington is doing its uh, Flags for Heroes uh, at the top of uh, Park Ave around the water tower. I would uh, suggest uh, members of the committee and the public to go up to the top of the hill. There's two giant signs that have been put up. It gives you uh, things. This fundraiser supports uh, scholarships for high school seniors. Future agenda items. Mr. Schlickman just gave me one a second ago. Is there any other members that would like one? I would like to I'm, uh, suggest that uh, on our next meeting, uh, discussion and materials will be sent forward to change our school committee meeting of uh, June 10th. Uh, there's a conflict with teacher recognition day. So um, I will see, I will be talking to Dr. Bodie about this and getting materials out to you folks and so it will be discussed to what extent, I don't know. You all set on this? Okay, we're gonna, yes, Mr. Thelman. Wait a minute, June 10th, you wanna move the June 10th meeting? Um, a discussion on it because okay. there's a conflict with teacher recognition day. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, okay. You don't know the day or the time yet. You know. No. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to give people a heads up for our next meeting, a potential discussion. Dr. Bodie and I will get together and we will get you the necessary materials to, so that you're prepared to, for the discussion. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
We're going to, at this time, enter executive session to conduct strategies in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or current contract negotiations with union or non-union in which if held in open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct a strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective, uh, the, collective, uh, the issues that we're going to be discussing are principal contracts and AAA memorandum of agreement. We will be returning to a regular meeting at, at the end of the executive session. Do I have a motion to go into our executive session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. The chair votes yes. We will now go into executive session. Uh, welcome back, everyone. The Arlington School Committee has exited uh, executive session. At this time, I will entertain a motion uh, with regard to the approval of uh, the memorandum of agreement for the uh, AAA contract. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. The chair votes yes, unanimous. Uh, thank you all. I will now entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Not debatable. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes. Ms. K Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Chair votes yes. Thank you, folks. One down, 28 to go. Whatever. <laughs> Have a good job, Bill. Have oh, a good night. weekend. Good night. Good night.